Welcome, everybody, to Radicalized Truth Survives podcast. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda, and today High Fidelity and I are going to be interviewing a young man named Omar Paez. I met Omar when I was at the Byline Festival in the United Kingdom last weekend. He has dedicated so much of his life to electoral integrity and human rights issues, and he's going to tell us some shocking news out of Mexico from the recent election, assassinations, uh, ballot denials, and what that really means for the United States. Welcome, Omar. So happy to see you again. Uh, Omar and I met at the Byline Festival in the United Kingdom last weekend. Uh, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Omar has done some very important work around the recent election in Mexico. And can you please brief our friends on uh, what your background is that made you uh, able to do such a granular report? Of course. Well, thank you, Heidi. It's 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 such an honor being here. And it was a pleasure meeting you last weekend as well. So the reason why I got so involved in reporting what happened in, in the Mexican elections was because I just wanted to vote. And I had registered to vote from from the UK where, where I live. And I registered, I applied, and everything got accepted perfectly fine in February. But then in April, all of a sudden, myself, along with 50,000 other Mexican citizens who live abroad, got a notification saying that our right to vote from abroad was revoked, um, allegedly because there was an inconsistency with our application, which essentially created the, the question as to whether that was actually something that we had done, that, that 50,000 of us had, you know, missed. I mean, that to me sounds like voter suppression. No matter yeah. how they sell it, it sounds to me like you identified potential voter suppression. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, so I mean, it, it did seem a bit odd that all of a sudden after we all got ac accepted that we got the right to vote from abroad revoked. So I obviously started looking into that and, and, and seeing whether there was anything I can do to obviously cast my vote because it, it's it was such a crucial election. I mean, the the, the two um, front runner candidates are are were, were both both women. Um, one of them, uh, Shane Baum, who who won, she represented the party that's currently in office with current president um, Lopez Obrador, who we all call by AMLO by his initials. Um, and the other candidate, Sochil, she was backed by a coalition of traditionally rivaled parties. That we that that those parties have been obviously battling against each other since the mid 1900s, right? And so this coalition began because a lot of the people, a, a, a lot of the public felt like the direction that AMLO was was taking Mexico through wasn't necessarily the best one for the country, um, which is why a lot of the country, which is why you had. The, the coalition come up and as, and as well many citizens become very invested in in voting so when that happened to me i looked into potentially maybe um appealing that and trying to vote from abroad as well or maybe actually going to mexico to cast my vote and i i chose the latter so when i went to mexico to vote i did see a lot of supposed irregularities that happened on election day so as you begin witnessing that and as you understand the deterioration of 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 democracy that we have been seeing around the world it, it's it, it obviously did raise the question as to whether there was something else behind everything and and obviously i don't want to accuse anything or, or sorry accuse anyone of of any sort of um foul play but it just seemed to, to me that a lot of um you know processes that that should have flow, like flowed easily weren't and a wow. lot of people weren't able to so what i'm going to read from your report because you identified really a democracy in crises and this is what really shocked me what you wrote in byline supplement was the electoral season was the deadliest in modern history with a total number of 37 assassinated candidates in the lead up to the elections on June 2nd, more than 400 candidates asked for protection and security for their campaigns. 
the opposition criticized uh, AMLO's HUDs, not bullets approach to tackling organized crime, pointing to the rise in violence across the country as evidence of its ineffectiveness. And a prominent newspaper in Spain, El Mundo, reported that AMLO's failure to curb violence tainted Mexico's elections. I read that and immediately wanted you on our show because that is shocking to me. When you talk about 37 assassinated candidates, and as you know, we just had an incident in Pennsylvania uh, yesterday at a Trump rally. And when, when, when you see an escalation like that, what does it tell you about what happened in June in Mexico? So the issue that many people have um, attributed this this horrifying situation to is that um, many of those candidates were necessarily to the organized crime likings, which is why they wanted to get rid of them or get them out of the way. Obviously, there there are no concrete reports or solid evidence that that actually shows that that connection, but um, it it is. It is a terrifying um, th situation to to be in. Whether you know, in in hypothetical in in a hypothetical case, if you're a candidate that that you know may not want to necessarily um, collude with or organized crime, and they remove you from the game. I mean, it is quite terrifying. And then what you guys saw in the U.S. yesterday. I mean, like that's something that has received a lot of media attention, and and even here in the U.K. when when the Labour MP Joe Cox got murdered, unfortunately, um, very sadly, on a week before the Brexit referendum in 2016, that's something that we are still hearing about and obviously commemorating as as we should. But in contrast, we didn't really see that for all those candidates in Mexico because, in a way, it it was just overshadowed by 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 the daily occurrence, which is the violence, the or organized crime, and and obviously you know, a lot of impunity that, that goes on. Wow, thank you for explaining that. Hi-Fi, jump in. I have so many questions, but I think it's very important that we are trying to shine a spotlight on what's happening in Mexico so the world takes notice. So we talk about organized crime. Um, and I, I lived in Mexico back in the 90s. I love the country of Mexico. Um, and it has made me very, very sad to see the infiltration of organized crime throughout all levels of the country from, you know, local farmers uh, being held up by protection rackets to, as you stated, politicians being assassinated. Um, I feel like everywhere we look globally, there is an element of organized crime which has gotten into politics. In the UK, we see it with the Russians in London grad and the money laundering. Uh, in the United States with Trump, we see it with the money laundering, the real estate. Um, in Germany and France, we see it as well. Uh, rich people with ties to sordid things occurring. Um, gaining power in these countries do you see that in mexico as much as if not more than other countries when it comes to cartels putting people in positions of power that they want obviously not every single politician that has won in these elections or in previous elections per se has ties to the organized crime many of them have won democratically and 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 in a fair process uh, as it should be but we have seen increasingly that more politicians do allegedly have ties to the organized crime and to the cartels and that is why ultimately they end in those positions of power however what what has been much more palpable in mexico is the fact that there's an absence of law enforcement right. um and it may be as well because a lot of those law enforcement agents could be um, colluded with the organized crime, which which allows them to obviously, you know, do as they please without any single scrutiny. So I 
do feel that while that is a trend that's happening globally, I feel that we're feeling it in Mexico because um, that that absence of the law enforcement not not only is allowing that organized crime, those cartels to grow and to, and to infiltrate, but also um, low, lower level, more, maybe more uh, petty criminals, as, as can be described, also operate because they do see that there is a huge level of impunity. So in a way, it, 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 it doesn't feel like, like the government's looking after you. It doesn't feel like the police are looking after you. And, and it doesn't really feel like a safe place to be. And there are obviously really safe places in Mexico, and there are obviously very unsafe places in Mexico, but the overall perception is that the violence and the organized crime in the country has has increased exponentially, especially because the current president that 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 we have, AMLO, he he implemented this hugs, not bullets strategy towards trying to tackle the the organized crime, which essentially just says that that they would rather not um meet them with bullets per se. Thank you for explaining that. First, I want to also commend you on your dedication of actually flying to Mexico to cast your ballot. I mean, that is, if, if Americans understood how precious it was to have, you know, a free and fair election and really cherished it in the way they, they should, I don't think we would have had anything uh, like we had on January 6th a few years ago. Um, one thing I want to reference from your article was you talked about the polling stations across Mexico being overwhelmed by mm. unprecedented demand, also running out of uh, ballots, which of course is gonna anger people. That to me is really shocking. But then you point out something that I think is very important that we all need to take a look at, that the chaos wasn't confined to Mexico because you had similar situations in LA, New York, and Madrid. And this mm. goes back to this global thing, like here we are, uh, you know, really, horrified at what you're telling us happened in Mexico, and yet we are dealing with this here in America where we are becoming a lawless country. We have a lawless, um, we have lawless members of our Supreme Court, our highest court, green lighting, basically making it legal to essentially kill Americans with recent rulings. And so I guess I think it's very important that, you know, we all just kind of take a pause and think about what we have had and what we are quickly losing and how we talk about this on the show, um, High Fidelity, Jim and I, how a decade ago, half the country, half the world was ruled by democracies. Now, 78% of uh, the globe is ruled by autocracies. So we are trending in the wrong direction. And what breaks my heart about your story is you talk about this coalition that came uh, you know, built up around the candidate. What did Mexico lose when they were not able to elect um, the uh, mayor that you told me about when we were in the UK? Can you describe the loss and what she might have represented for the country? Yeah, so so Sochil, she represented uh, unity. She represented it's all of us against what you highlighted, Heidi, um, more of like an authoritarian resembling power right that that has taken over mexico and and i i it was weird because i mean like obviously this is something that's not quantifiable but but it really did seem that everyone no matter your background no matter your socioeconomic status everyone was supporting her so wow. so it it did feel obviously it was heartbreaking to to see her defeat and also it was um quite eye-opening to, to see obviously the 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 difference in the results right because it, i mean shane baum beat Sochil by by a, a landslide i mean it shane baum got even more votes that amlo did in 2018 which is when we had the last elections but to make it back to to to, to what you were saying um there there has been an overwhelming concern that these may be the last free elections that that we had because in 2022 there was a lot of um of a push from the from the current government from AMLO to to try and dismantle what we have as a national electoral institute and a lot of people obviously took the streets and and defended the the INE which is what we call the electoral institute saying that 
that Ina should not be touched, that it should remain autonomous and unbiased. Um, and instead, what happened was obviously that the, the INE uh, was still preserved, but it got defunded. And then a lot of the senior leadership that were there previously left. And that opened the doors for for new leadership that allegedly has ties to AMLO and to his party of Morena. So now with Sheinbaum winning the presidency, uh, they have activated this Plan C, which is quite similar to um, Project 2025 and, and what obviously that has been unfolding in the US and, and the likelihood of that happening if Trump were, were, were to win. But Plan C just entails that, uh, I mean, there's going to be a dissolution of the judicial powers across Mexico and also of, of autonomous organs such as the INE. So that is why the concern that this was the last free and fair election that, that we had was it. As free as it was, right, because obviously there were a bunch of, of, of obstacles that, that happened not only in Mexico, and but across the, the U.S. and Spain as well, in Paris. Wow, so you talk five. about You talk about the INE, the uh, National Election Institute. Uh, the American analogy, I would think, would be the FEC, the Federal Election Commission. You were stating that Morena's party had someone installed at the head of your election institute who seems to have ties to Morena and as yeah. such has made decisions as the head of the INE which benefit Morena's party. Is that correct? That That is what the public perception has been, yes. Correct. And Heidi, you mentioned that, that yes, that, that I noted that this was an unprecedented, um, well, sorry, that, that the election saw unprecedented demands and that there were ballot shortages. But sure, the, the scale of, of the election may have been unprecedented, but it wasn't unexpected because everyone knew that this was going to be the largest election. Everyone knew that uh, nearly 100 million Mexicans, which is nearly 75% of the country, was going to be able to vote, right? right? The, the problems came when people like myself got a right to vote revoked from abroad, mm -hmm. or when people struggled to actually cast their vote on that day in Mexico because there were ballot shortages. When, when it's strange because as the Electoral Institute, you are supposed to be aware of the of the percentage of the number of people that are going to go and try and cast their ballots. So, so to have seen that thousands of people were not able to vote was alarming as well. I, I mean, I'm, I, again, I'm reviewing your uh, material as you're talking and my heart is breaking. You actually sent us video of people chanting that they want to vote because they did run out of ballots and they'd been queued up for hours. And I think that that is, you know, it, it is, it is heartbreaking. And you mentioned Project 2025. We know that Project 2025, as our friend Craig Unger just said on our show last week, is a recipe for the end of democracy. And I don't think that people who have been used to freedom ever know when it may be the last chance they get to vote in a free and fair election. And we saw what happened in Russia uh, when Putin in 2011, there was an uprising of people and Putin tried to pin that on Hillary Clinton because she said we need to have an international investigation on what happened in that election. And that began the virtual assassination mm -hmm. of Hillary Clinton by uh, Russian military intelligence. And I would think that part of what your activism and, and you know, your work would be, would be to demand an international investigation on what happened in this election because there are just so many irregul irregularities that you document that just to do what we did in 2016 and sweep it under the rug that's why we're facing you know confederacy 2.0 right now in america because we swept a a huge the biggest crime in our country's history under the rug yeah well i mean i i think that Obviously, I, I personally would have loved um, for an international investigation to, to have 
taking place and, and to all these irregularities who have maybe been investigated a bit um, deeper. But the problem has been that, that the media legitimized the election as soon as the projected victory was announced. Um, and also it, it has given the sense that, that, I mean, even though Shane Baum has, you know, ha had her victory by, by a landslide, I mean, it didn't really leave that much of an opportunity to, to investigate, okay, maybe there was a bit of a discrepancy that, you know, that, that caused, you know, Sochi to lose by so many votes versus Shane Baum winning because the margin was so big. So how can you necessarily, you know, question that, right? When, when the victory is being l legitimized and when the results have been crystal clear that the overwhelming majority wanted shame them. But I think that if we take apart all these supposed irregularities, we can maybe understand how all of this accumulated to the results that, that we saw on June the, the 2nd. But beyond that, there's also a very important factor, which, which was the fact that the president um, had been campaigning for Shanebaum for for months, if not years. I mean, as soon as 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 it was known that that Shanebaum was going to be the candidate for Morena, Amlo began campaigning for her. So there was a lot of state intervention, and there was a lot of disinformation from the state claiming that benefits were going to be taken away if the opposition won. So so whether you want it or not, sure, there may have been irregularities that may have tipped the the scale in a certain amount, right? But a lot of it also came from the fear mongering that was planted to the voters and that it really did sway the votes to go a certain way. So they used psychological fear messaging to sway the population. And isn't it illegal in Mexico for a political party to, to campaign for a candidate? I didn't believe that was legal in Mexico. Yeah, so, so I mean, one thing that I've noted is that um, politicians tend to, unfortunately, in this day and age, like pol politicians tend to be more in a scale where things are not necessarily illegal for them, but they're unlawful. So, yeah, I mean, like it is un unlawful for the sitting president to be campaigning for his candidate for his party. Um, but there are constitutional protections that that won't allow him to be sanctioned. So he was kind of relying on that. So he was playing in a gray zone where mm -hmm. even though it's immoral, it's unethical, he's still going to do it because he can't be punished for it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and I mean, when the elections happened, the opposition candidate, Sochil, and then she lost, she said that she was going to go back, back to the Senate because she obviously took a break from the Senate to run as a candidate, and she said that she was going to present some lawsuits against the electoral, well, from the electoral process, primarily against the, the president for the intervention that that he um, that he had with the election process. So, in those rulings, which came back quite quickly, it, it got essentially highlighted that that yeah, sure, the the president did breach electoral law, um, but because there was a constitutional protection uh, for him, he wasn't really going to get sanctioned. So it seems like if he knew that by campaigning for Shanebaum, for his candidate, he would be breaching electoral law and it would be unlawful, but there wasn't going to be any sort of consequence for him. Wow. Wow. It's just incredible. And as I'm listening to you describe what happened in Mexico, I'm thinking of all of the elections recently in the last decade or so that did not have election integrity. So, uh, you know, Putin would not be president. Boris Nemtsov would be president if Putin hadn't gamed his own elections and made himself, you know, emperor or czar or whatever. And then, of course, we had the Belarusian election, which, uh, you know, again, a pro-democracy person would be running that country. They didn't have an interference. Uh, I can look back at the Georgia election. And here we are in the precipice of the American election. And it is really, really um, heartbreaking that more people aren't revolting against having their sacred election rights being stolen from them. And you document 
in both your report and what you sent us, some of the irregularities. Can you walk us through just some of the things that you noticed where uh, there was a different tally and you have like examples of that? Because I want people to understand that, you know, it's not just you surmising this, there's actual documented evidence of these irregularities. Yeah, of course. So on election night, um, the official announcement of, of the progress of the results got delayed multiple times. They were originally, originally going to be announced at 10.30, then it got pushed to 11, 11.30, then nearly midnight. And that's when um, the president of the INE, the, the one that has been criticized to be quite um, close to Morena, she announced that that Shanebone had a leading um, victory in front of, of, of Xochitl. So wow. immediately what, what happened was that Xochitl took to Twitter and started tweeting very cryptic messages such as they're hiding the votes, um, don't let them fool you or um I, I mean i'm I'm not quoting exactly yeah. off, it's just out of memory and also she tweeted a photo of the electoral sheet at her polling station so in mexico you have each polling station and in those polling stations you're you're meant to have a manually tallied electoral sheet that breaks down how many votes each party got and in the photo she posted of her of her polling station's electoral sheet she had one which obviously I mean, each polling station allows a thousand, maybe a couple thousand um, citizens to, to vote in each polling station. So she inspired a lot of people to go out and take as many photos as they can of the electoral sheets of their own polling stations or those nearby. And and all like the social media platforms were just flooded with images of the different electoral sheets. And a lot of them had Sochi winning over Shanebaum but then when they got compared to the digitalized results, there were discrepancies in the counting. Okay. Um, so there, there have been a, a, a couple of photos where you have the manual sheet that says, for example, I'm I'm giving a, a, a made up number, but say that Sochi's party had 500, then Shane Buck's party had like 200, but then in the digitalized version, Sochi would have 300 and Shane Buck would have 600. So, there were those types of, of discrepancies, but then, wow. um, but yeah, so the INA did say that, that a lot of these uh, discrepancies in the, in, in the numbers were necessarily a result of alleged voter fraud, but it was more because, because you had contiguous ballot boxes in a polling station, meaning that you had multiple ballot boxes within a polling station to obviously break down the demand of those, um, um, of the quantity of votes that got taken place at that polling station. So wow. that's why maybe it would say something, but at the end, in the digitalized version, it would include those other votes that were in a different sheet, per se, from the same polling station. Uh, so that, that, was, that was their story. And again, this would require an investigation because we would want to know every ballot was counted. And you're already telling me that 50,000 people were denied the ability to vote. And then... They ran out of ballots, so imagine what those numbers are. Um, one thing I want to say that uh, you said that was really important is that the media just announced it was done the next day. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we had in America. And that was the beginning of real heartbreak for me. I went to the Women's March, and I will never forgive the museum because there it was the day after the inauguration, and every single newspaper just acted like we hadn't just been attacked uh, from, you know, both within and without. It was so normalized. And, you know, I wrote a series on the 2016 election attacks that Hi-Fi helped me with. And, um, you know, it's all there. It's all there in court records, public documents, the coordination between, you know, American traitors and Russian military intelligence. And I just think that papering over um, these, what really amounts to crimes, even if we're just talking about being denied the right mm -hmm. to vote uh, when you're out of the country and then having ballots, you know, uh, go missing when people are queuing up for a very long time. That sounds very, you know, yeah. unethical to me. And I just feel like, you know, we're at this, tipping point, this terrible crisis globally, 
And what do you recommend we do? Like, what is the move to make in order to turn this ship around? Because it's going nowhere good. Yeah, well, so I, I will get back to, to your question, but I do want to highlight that the number of people that were enabled to vote is probably much more higher than 50,000. I mean, as far as we know, 50,000 people living abroad got the right to vote revoked. Many of them appealed and many of them were later um, able to, to re-register. Others maybe went back to Mexico like, like I did. Um, so we don't necessarily know that the percentage of, of those people that were able to kind of like actually exercise the right to vote. But in Mexico, you did see thousands of people as well that were queuing to vote in person who lived in Mexico, who were registered to vote in Mexico that weren't able to vote, as well as people that were trying to vote in person in places like in New York or in LA or in Madrid. I, I actually know people in, in both in New York and in Madrid that queued for hours after being registered to vote in the Mexican consulate and weren't able to vote. And then in Mexico, you had 40,000 people in the southern state of Chiapas that were not able to vote because the organized crime just didn't allow them to because they would either burn the, the polling stations down, they would uh, threaten or kidnap those campaign, um, so, sorry, the, the, they would threaten or, or kidnap the, the um, electoral advisors or, or, or anyone who was helping out with the development of, of the of, of, of the voting process. So we don't really know how many people exactly weren't able to vote. Um, but to answer your question, Heidi, I, I think that what we need to do is we we need to recognize where our countries stand and what it is that we can do as citizens, journalists, activists, in order to obviously build pressure around this and not allow our our democracy to to erode more than it already is um because for now what's most concerning in mexico is that sure shame won the the presidency and 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 i'm sure that 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 she won fair and square despite the irregularities because the obviously the the landslide victory and the and the gap between sochi and shame was quite big obviously there were lots of implications that could um entail that 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 gap right but what's concerning is that her party morena has the majority of the congress and that's where the the fear is because there is that the, there won't be any checks and balances as we move forward because they've already announced like i said dissolving the the judicial powers um dissolving all the autonomous um institutions so at the end of the day, it's going to end up being very centralized. And if that happens, you're running the risk of obviously, you know, losing your freedom of press, freedom of speech and and living in, a, in an authoritarian regime. So I think that moving aside from whether the parties are in the left or the right and if they and if we agree with their policies and their ideologies, I think that what we start what we need to start focusing on is whether the options that are on the ballot whether they are displaying authoritarian tendencies because if they are then that's the, that's going to be where the where, where the danger is that's going to be bad news because that is what's ultimately going to give the party whether left or right all the power and that's you know that's that's what's going to obviously take a toll on on democracy really really well stated thank you so much um one more thing for me and then hi-fi uh, take us home i i look you know we heard a you know mexico got its first you know female leader and everybody was, you know, excited. And then I, as an investigative reporter, took a step back and thought, gosh, this smells a little bit like Maloney. This smells a little bit like the soft fascism that Maloney has been delivering in Italy. And I think that there may be some fair comparisons there. Um, and again, my heart breaks because the uh, candidate who was defeated, I think would have been, you know, an incredible, uh, you know, ally for the pro-democracy for continuing democratic governance. And that is, I, you know, something that, again, my heart breaks a bit hearing what you're telling us. High five. So we discussed that Plan C is basically Project 2025 in America. Mm -hmm. We've discussed that there were multiple assassinations in Mexico uh, we just had an attempted assassination in the United States of President, you know, former President Trump. 
Um, do you think that what happened in Mexico when it comes to voting and the irregularities and all of the strangeness and the death, should that serve as an incredibly strong warning for the United States from Mexico? I think it I think it it should. And I think that the the problem is that again, the obviously every country has its own, you know, its its own threats, its own issues, and its own cultural um implications that 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 may dictate the way that that politics operates right but i think that the common trend that we are seeing is erosion of democracy and and i think that um the assassinations that that took place obviously show how the organized crime is dominating mexico and how in a way you you i mean many of those candidates whether they were colluded or not they were necessarily to their to the to the organized crimes liking we were talking about the threats on election integrity and democracies you know throughout the world and bringing it back to mexico but give us like the best thing you want to leave us with like the most important thing if you were summarizing you know to, to people if you had an opportunity to talk to people globally about the importance of this subject matter Give us like your, you know, your your zinger uh, summary statement. I would say that that given the the threats that democracy has seen worldwide, I mean, it obviously it it does require every one of us to to be a bit more proactive in terms of of being more politically active, you know, and and reading the news, not tuning out because obviously. It may seem too toxic, or it may seem, you know, too depressing to to make us so disengage. I think that ultimately, we forget that elections have the power to really turn the tide around, like we saw in the UK, like we saw in France, um, thanks to obviously like the the strategy behind the campaigning and the alliances and the coalition, which in a way could have resulted positively in Mexico had Sochi won. But I think that what's most important is to is to obviously want to defend our rights and to defend our opportunities to obviously keep on progressing. Because if we allow parties that pose a threat to democracy, whether they're on the left, whether they're on, on the right, but if they follow an authoritarian um, blueprint, then, then it's not going to matter what their ideology is at the end of the day, because we're not going to be able to exercise our rights as the younger generation reaches that that voting age, I mean, it's it's important for everyone, especially them, to obviously become informed. And despite the the political ideologies, just obviously always go for the option that's going to safeguard democracy. Because at the end of the day, that is what's going to guarantee us to keep on progressing, us to keep on challenging the politicians, holding them to to account, exercising our our rights as well and and not losing our voice which is so powerful when we have to stand up to to call out these threats to call out any sort of disinformation or voter suppression issues that may regress us into into a point that could be irreversible like we've seen in countries around the world such as venezuela thank you so very much for that um the stakes are just too high and i I no, really appreciate your advocacy work. I appreciate your reporting, everything that you do around um, making people aware of election integrity and the value of the vote. Thank you so much for being with us today, Omar. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi.